Hi everyone, welcome to our four-part series studying the art of the icon. Again, uh, I hope that everybody who was on the March for Life found themselves uh, prayerful and uh, engaging in prayerful uh, practice, prayerful protest. In addition, I hope that uh, all of you who were on retreat last week are settled back in as best as you can. Today we'll be studying uh, the first parts of The Art of the Icon by Paul of Dachimov, that part which introduces the essentials of Eastern Catholicism, the theological tradition of Eastern Catholicism. The image before you is, of course, uh, of John the Baptist, his glorified body present, the beheaded, his beheading, an image depicted through him holding his own head, wings on his body, an image of himself as the forerunner, the one who comes before. This is an image that's not meant to be taken sort of historically. It's not an imitation of everything that's happened to John the Baptist. Rather, it depicts something of John the Baptist, and it invites us to contemplate that something. And so we will be developing the essential theory today of, of what, it is to be con what it is to contemplate. Paul F. Dachimov, born in 1901, dying in 1970, is an Orthodox theologian, originally not from Paris, but who did his studies in Paris, escaping uh, some of the tyranny uh, at the time of the, of the Russian Revolution. His education was under some of the, the best Orthodox theologians of the day who were actually working in Paris at the time, studying with figures like Sergei Bolkakov uh, and others who would come to sort of found the centrality of Orthodox theology in the 20th century. Uh, this sort of theology had a, a great influence on Hans Urs von Balthasar, on Rowan Williams, and on uh, Benedict XVI. Indeed, though we're not going to perform this exercise together, it might be worthwhile just to take a moment to write down uh, and to pause the recording here. According to Evdokimov, how is beauty theological? Second, in what way is the liturgy beautiful for Evdokimov? These two questions really form the parts one and parts two of the text. Today I hope to give a kind of grammar to Eastern Christian theology. We'll be looking at four themes, logos and logoi, Theosis, energy, and the passions and asceticism. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form or shape, with darkness over the abyss, and a mighty wind sweeping over the waters, then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good. God then separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Evening came, and morning followed, the first day. This first few verses of Genesis are remarkable. In the beginning, in fact, before there was anything like a beginning outside of time, when there's darkness and nothingness, disorder, God speaks a word, and from this word, what is disordered begins to become ordered. Light shines. Early tradition of the church noticed that there is no sun yet in the creation narrative. That being the case, what is this light that's being talked about? And for actually uh, rabbinic co commentators, as well as the early patristic tradition, this light is perceived as nothing less than this spiritual light, this spiritual meaning that orders the cosmos from the beginning. That God, who is word, speaks a word, and this word comes to be reflected in all the gorgeousness of creation. That there's a logos, a meaning, an ultimate destiny to creation. And that, in some ways, all of creation are words about the word. That they, creation reflects 
the beauty of God, God who is beauty. We are little words about this word. If Dakimov pays attention to this, the art of contemplation is at the heart of the Father's cosmology. The vision of the archetypal logoi, or the thoughts of God concerning being and things, builds up a grandiose visual theology, an iconsophy. Each thing possesses its own logos, its interior word, its entelechy. Entelechy means that uh, its final end, it's what it was made to do, something that is, um, that is ordered to this particular end. It comes from Aristotle. And that its entelechy, which is closely tied to the concrete thing itself, it is the adequate correspondence between the form and the content, its logos. Their intimate interpretation, the secret coinciding, reveals itself in terms of light and constitutes beauty. Through our encounter with the created order, if only we bring eyes to see, we can pierce through and perceive already words about the word, some interior meaning to creation that points us towards the gift of God, that actually creation has a light that shines forth to us, revealing to us something about God's identity. That this, for Evdokimov, is the very nature of beauty, this correspondence between form and content, between the idea and the actual expression of this idea in a particular object. That something can be known about God from the very beginning in the romance experienced between a couple, in sunlight piercing through a meadow, even in the context of the sorrow of death and the human community who gathers around the beloved, who mourns them, Something of God is already manifested in that moment. In the liturgy, this is particular true. That is, there's something about creation that is intended for its final end for divine worship, for this full participation in God. Think for a moment about stained glass windows. It has become somewhat commonplace to say that stained glass windows are the Bible of the illiterate, that they present to them the essential images and narratives, though they did not read the scriptures. Yet this is only part of, uh, of why stained glass is stained glass, right? Because it would be just as easy to have depicted these images in a nice book, or perhaps painted them on walls, and indeed there are murals and paintings upon walls. Why stained glass? Well, there's something about stained glass that reveals the very end of which light was created for. For example, if you're at the Basilica of the Sacred Heart on a Sunday morning at the 10 a.m. Mass at Notre Dame, you'll notice the incense that rises up from the altar. The light that pierces through the stained glass windows and diffuses in the incense. An almost sort of play that's going about the altar, a, a playfulness, a gift a superabundant love made present. That this stained glass windows actually work to reveal the final end of which light was created. Light was created to shine through these windows, to enable and to participate our worship. Integral and connected to this, this relationship between the logos and the logoi, the word and the words, is the term theosis. In his chapters on knowledge, Maximus the Confessor, an early Eastern Christian, sort of medieval Eastern Christian theologian, writes, In Christ who is God and the word of the Father, there dwells in bodily form the complete fullness of deity by essence. In us, the fullness of deity dwells by grace, whenever we have formed in ourselves every virtue and wisdom, lacking in no way which is possible to man in the faithful reproduction of the archetype. For it is not unnatural thereby that the fullness of deity dwell also in us by adoption. Theosis, or divinization, describes how human beings are taken up into God's life. That humanity 
was originally created its own entelechy in the image and likeness of God, meant to share entirely what it meant to be God. Yet, at the fall, we confuse what it meant to be divine. God who creates the world out of no reason, who gives himself for no reason, who loves for no reason. This is not the God whom we imitate in the fall. The God we imitate grasps, seizes power at all costs. And though we thought in seizing that apple we were becoming like God, in fact, we became less like God. We fell from what was our original destiny to become divine. And in Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, who though he was in the form of God, did not claim equality with God as something to be grasped at, but rather emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men. He emptied himself, humbled himself, even to the point of death, death on a cross. That Jesus Christ takes up all that it means to be human, even death itself, and invites each of us to, to also become divine. That our destiny, too, is to become divine. Divine, like Christ, reveals what divinity is, the one who loves unto the end. And that we can take on virtues, take on this life of God through a life of discipline and practice. And that this is how we're, we are saved. God became human so that humanity might become divine. Of course, theosis has a connection to art. That everything that's human is meant to be taken up into divine life. That nothing totally is eliminated. No image is entirely erased through sin. If Dakimov notes, Fill the earth and conquer it means to turn it, that is the earth, into God's temple. Consecrate the world means to force it to go from its demonic state to being God's creature. No form of life or culture can escape from God, from the universalism of the incarnation. Christ, who is the image of all perfections, is the supreme and unique bishop, as well as the supreme and unique layman. Theosis is an essentially dynamic notion, and its action has an effect on every part of the cosmos in the same way that doxology spreads God's glory over everything that is human. Creation's destiny is not to be, the world is not meant to be in darkness, but it's meant to shine in the entirety of life. And human beings present to God, create that in the image and likeness of God we create, we make. And we consecrate the world back to God, restoring this original order of which it was intended. Culture, art, music is a manifestation of God insofar as we reveal what music and art and painting and image are supposed to be. Ultimately, this creation, this theosis takes place insofar as the human being becomes a living icon. Our lives become iconic. In the eternal liturgy of the future age, if Dakimov notes, man and woman will sing the glory of his Lord through all the cultural elements that have passed through the fire of the final purifications. But already here and now, men and women in community, scientists, artists, etc., who are all priests of the universal priesthood, celebrate their own liturgy where Christ's presence is manifested in accordance with the purity of the human celebrant. Like talented iconographers, they sketch a completely new reality by using the material of this world and the taboric light, and in this new reality, the mysterious face of the kingdom slowly begins to shine through. Look to your right. This is an image of the Orthodox ceremony for the crowning uh, of marriage that the couple take up the crowns, their original de destiny, as kings and queens, meant to rule over the created order, to transfigure it in love. That iconography, in the end, for Avdokimov, is not just about making images. Rather, it's about taking up all of the created world 
in image, to take it all up and re-consecrating it back to God. That all that is most human, all that is most created, is meant to be drawn back to the love of God. That is theosis or divinization. What about energy? In the text, Evdokimov makes a couple of claims, a sort of summation of what he would call Eastern Catholic theology. God became man, or God became human, so that humanity might become God by grace and participate in God's divine life. Uh, the human being is a being that has been ordered to become God. Man and woman must unite created nature and the uncreated divine energies through what is called synergy. I am man by nature and God by grace. Whoever participates in the divine energies becomes himself light in a certain sense. Man is both microcosm and microtheos, that in the human being is the entirety of the world, yet because of Christ in the human being is the entirety of God. I wanted to focus upon one of these claims in particular. Humanity must unite created nature and the uncreated divine energies through an act of synergy. That for Eastern Catholicism, one cannot know the, fully the essence of God, that God is transcendent, that God is beyond being, unable to be encountered face to face in God's self. Yet, God, the, God has created in the act of revelation a manner of participating in this, this, this essence these what he what is called energies that it's this kind of heat and light that shines off from the fullness of this essence of god and that we participate in through the scriptures through the liturgical rites of the church through icons through the the, the existence in the created order and that what we do is by encountering this by uniting our own created beings to what is revealed in essence, we take up this most natural world into God's life. If theosis is the general theory of, of that humanity is destined to become divine, energy is, is, the, is the method by which this is carried out, in which we somehow enter into God's very life, not by encountering the essence of God, the isness of God unto itself, but through a kind of mediation through all the created order. An example from liturgical feasts might be helpful. Consider, for example, uh, this icon, uh, Ethiopic icon from the foot washing. It presents to us the glory of this foot washing. The disciples gaze on with interest at what's happening while Peter has his feet washed. This moment, this icon, of course, takes place right before the passion of, of Christ. And here, of course, we know that it is Christ who's fully God and fully human. That something about the fullness of God's life is revealed in this moment in the history of salvation. As Adakavak notes, the icons of the liturgical feasts confess its epiphanic images. Through the visible, the invisible one advances toward us, greets us, and envelops us in his presence. Through contemplating this icon, we are not just contemplating a moment in time. For, for Eastern Catholicism, this is an encounter with the foot washing. It's an encounter with the very nature of who God is. And in some sense, part of us are taken up into this icon. We are... The fullness of God is revealed, and we are to dwell in the presence of God through the mediation of paint, of drawing, of figures, through this artistic genius. That in some ways, the entire liturgy is this energy that enables us to participate in God, this moment of kind of epiphanic revelation in which we come to see who God is. I wanted to play this short piece of music. It's a uh, kantakion, a, a Byzantine hymn for the Theophany of the Lord or the Baptism of the Lord or Epiphany. Uh, 
in the Eastern Catholicism, Epiphany is actually about the baptism of the Lord. It's not about the coming of the Magi, per se. I wanted to play this music just to have you listen to it, as well as the text. Thou hast appeared today to the inhabited earth, and thy light, O Lord, has been This Kentuckian, sung by Father Apostolos Hill, is an English translation that captures a bit of the mystery of the chant itself. The very root of the chant, as you can hear, is a kind of humming, a, a low bass note that keeps it sort of grounded in a, in a manifestation. That this is an event that is unfolding in our midst right now. Yet the words present to us a kind of slow contemplation of what's taking place. That here in Christ, in Christ's baptism, it is God's very light, something of God's light shines through. If we but have the eyes to see. That this light, as we perceive it, as we dwell in it, as we sing this hymn, we are invited to participate in this light. The energies of God released in the liturgical rite, take us up, not into God's essence, but enable us to participate in this essence. Through the most bodily ways, through a heart lifted up through hymnody in praise of God. Yet, of course, things are never that easy, are they? That we're just as much to confuse the logoi of God, these words, about God, and instead to turn them into idols. To worship not God through the created order, but to worship the created order itself. We're just as likely to avoid the energies, to remain blind to the fullness of what is revealed. The fact is, is that human beings sin and are controlled by what Evdokimov will call the passions. This is from Maximus the Confessor on his 400 chapters on love. Some thoughts are simple, others compound. The simple are without passion, but the compound are with passion, as composed of passion plus representation. In this case, one can see that many simple thoughts follow on the compound, when they have begun to be moved to sin by the mind. A passionate thought arises in someone's memory about gold. In his mind, he has the urge to steal, and with his heart, he accomplishes the sin. That rather than gaze at creation soberly, rather than perceive the Taboric light that shines through, we often use the creation for our own disordered purposes. We look at the human body and are attracted so much by it, we turn it into a pornographic image. Rather than perceive creation as this super abundant, extravagant gift of love, we destroy it, destroy the environment, in order so that we can um, conquer the world. Yet passions need not simply be acted upon. Passions come to the mind. They're the movement of our affections and our desires in a disordered manner. 
I notice, for example, that a colleague of mine has received a promotion. Of course, I would never walk up to this colleague and say to him, I am extremely jealous of your promotion and wish you did not receive it so that for a, but moment, for what, for a moment I could still feel good about myself. No one would say that. But in, the, in our heart of hearts, we look at this moment, we look at this gift, and we think to ourselves, ah, this person should not have received it. I do not want this person to receive it. I wish this person would not receive this good. Passions can operate without ever being articulated or performed upon. And thus, for the Eastern Church, the goal through ascetic practice, through fasting, through custody of the eye, through all those practices in which we try to reform the passions, the goal is apatheia, or to be passionless. Now, this doesn't mean that I don't care about anything or I don't love my son. Rather, it means to be without these sort of disordered passions, to, to be so that the only thing we know how to do is to love. If Dokumov notes this, Healing as seen in the Gospels implies an ascetic catharsis, a purification of the human person of every demonic seed. But this ascetic catharsis is completed by an ontological catharsis, that is the restoration of the initial form of the image of God, as well as its real transfiguration in nature. That here we have a kind of synergy, a combination of God's work and our work together in Eastern Catholicism that indeed it, it is learning to, to operate without the passions, this ascetic catharsis, a purification of the human person. But it's only made possible through a prior ontological catharsis, that some part of our identity is changed, that we're restored to that image of God through the rites of baptism, through our participation in the Eucharist, and thus nature itself is transformed. That our encounter in the liturgy with this ontological catharsis, with the manner in which we perceive as all of creation is being properly reordered to its final destiny, the worship of God, invites us to this ascetic catharsis, that we desire to reform our own, our own lives so that we can perceive anew the divine beauty of God. This is very deeply connected to Avdokimov's conception of art in chapter 7 of the first part. He writes, The liturgy teaches us today more than ever before that art decomposes not because it is the child of its times, but because it refuses its priestly functions. To create a theophonic art and to set the icon in the middle of buried and disappointed hopes, the icon which is the angel of the presence dressed in a coat of many covers, the Sophionic beauty of the church. Its face is human. On the other hand, it is the holy face of the God-man. And on the other, it is the woman robed with the sun, the joy of all joys, she who fights against all sadness and from whom flows an inexhaustible spring of tenderness. This image to the right, for someone like Evdokimov, would be considered unbeautiful. Not because it's Western alone, but rather what it fails to do is in some ways to create a theophonic art, to present an icon in which the full mystery of God is revealed through, mediated through paint and form. That in some ways the temptation to look at this image on the right is to see it and to say, look at the family, look at the tenderness of the family. I want to be this family, all of which is good. But it risks saying almost too much about this holy family. That there's something about liturgical art for Evdokimov that is ascetic, eschesis. That it speaks at the same time that it remains silent. It reveals and conceals. It invites us to contemplation without revealing everything. In this regard, we're starting to have a sense or an idea of what liturgical beauty might consist of. Liturgical beauty is that which enables us to, 
to kind of live into God's life. Liturgical art and liturgical beauty must have a use. It enables us to move from the energies to some sort of encounter of God's life, to enter into it, to contemplate God, and to become the beauty that we contemplate. We will take up part two of the Art of the Icon uh, early next week, where we'll study specifically the role in the liturgy in this beauty. Have a great rest of the weekend.